Okay, and uh, we are recording. What's up? Hi, everyone. Today is uh, September 29th, 2018. We're here at St. Pete Beach with uh, DJ Jay Skrilla and myself, Sasha. Um, going to be talking a little bit about some, you know, state of the market things that happen in crypto. This is our, I think, third state of the market third? episode we're doing. Yep. The last one got my highest all-time ever views. This is our 89. first. That's our first. Our YouTube. first video one, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, so today we're going to talk a little bit about stable coins, LA token, my big coin broker, one broker. Uh, looking at the, you know, who reigns supreme, the CFTC or the SEC, um, and then we're going to look a little bit at the Anon coin and about. Um, our final topic will be about some government surveillance that has been recently brought to our attention on Twitter. So. Oh yeah, and uh, don't forget we're going to talk about some uh, new and exciting things too. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, stablecoin. Talk about that first. Um, so yeah, I uh, logged on to Poloniex a couple of days ago, and I saw they had were trading the USDC, which is Circle's um, stablecoin. Um, so in the past, Poloniex, Poloniex had in every exchange that used a stable coin mostly was using Tether, which, uh, is a Omni token that is on top of Bitcoin. Circle coin, the USDC is an ERC 20 token on top of Ethereum, built on top of Ethereum. Now, why do we need a bunch of stable coins? So that the owners of them can get rich. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the thing, Poloniex. Um, I'm I've always been a fan of Poloniex's exchange, their UI and everything. It was it was actually one of the top volume exchanges until they said you had to put in your KYC. <laughs> then he didn't like it so much. <laughs> well, I don't mind KYC. It's more like the passport photos and selfies. And that's just so that is weird. KYC though. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they really know me. Um, you know. Poloniex was a good exchange. Uh, it's still a, a decent exchange. It's now just it's a Goldman Sachs mm. exchange. Circles is owned by I think owned by Goldman Sachs. Circle bought Poloniex. Um, the funny, interesting, off topic, real quick. Poloniex owner, original owner, was a musician like myself, and uh, he started that exchange. So gives me hope that I can be a multi-billionaire in the future. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. So, so we make this a permanent backyard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the stable coins, um, they're re. All right. So Poloniex, you can't put USD, the dollar or any other currency on Poloniex. You've always needed to put either Tether or an altcoin or Bitcoin on Poloniex. So now, what they're trying to do is um, what they are doing with. Circle coin is you go to their circle website, you use USD to cash and buy circle coin, then you transfer circle coin to Poloniex, then you trade against their pairs. There's not there wasn't a lot of pairs when I looked a couple of days ago, um, but they are adding pairs. And um, then when you want to cash out and get USD back, then you transfer the stable coin to back to the circle app and you cash out. But the caveat here is that. Not only is Poloniex making the trading fees with you, but now they're making a 0.1% fee for cashing out. So, at the end of the day, it's a money grab, right? Um, it doesn't make anything streamlined or uh, easier to do. Is there any advantage of having the stablecoin? Stablecoin is good for the owners of the stable coin. It's good for people that trade in large quantities of money, I think, uh, especially especially the fact that you can trade uh, the stable coin on the circle stable coin against the tether stable coin. So, you know, if one stable coin is just a few percentages of a penny off, um, you know, you're trading in tens of hundreds of millions of dollars and that can add up quickly. You get some arbitrage on the stable to stable coin. Exactly. I don't know how long Tether is going to last on Poloniex. So that's kind of like up in the air. Or if like it's going to be a battle between Circle and Tether. Tether is Bitfinex's coin that has kind of been, you know, if you follow the space, you probably heard of uh, Tether and all its mysterious uh, 
you know, ownership and how it works. I don't know. I don't know anybody that's ever cashed out a tether for USD. I'm, maybe you can. But, uh, you know, usually you always hear about tether when somebody, when Omni, the, the uh, you know, tether is a token on top of Omni. And Omni is like a counterparty on top of Bitcoin. And every time they, pr they print new tokens of tether on Omni, it's announced quickly because usually that means the price of Bitcoin is going to go up. Um, so, and I've read some things that stated that all of the making of Tether was a big driving force in Bitcoin's price in the fall. Do you think there's any merit to that? I think it has a little bit to do with it because traders try to front run, and if they're front, you know, they, they hit, if they're trading, on, if that's the sentiment in the news, I mean, I think that was part of it. I don't think it was all of it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was just a big hype in blockchain, you know. The, the, sorry, getting to the masses as well, but certainly that was the tether was part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, what actually backs this? Like, I initially thought that stable coins were kind of like if you're trading in the stock market, you can move stuff to a money market account that you don't have to like move it. I mean, it is basically essentially like cash, but you could just move it there and then you buy into your next stock. I thought that's how tether was working but then it was explained to me that they're more like securitized assets of some sort do you know yeah they're just supposed to, they're supposed to be equally backed ever every tether printed should have one dollar backing it but isn't this the new one that oh, okay. poloniex did it's backed by something different than a dollar it's like backed by another coin that's then backed by them there's this, some weird I have, step i haven't to looked it. into that okay uh, but maybe it's backed by a basket of their I don't know. Jen Seth was explaining it in a chat and it was uh, very confusing. To yeah, me. I'm not as smart as Jen Seth. <laughs> <laughs> he said that this thing was not smart, that they were just making it like very much overcomplicated compared to what it needed to be yeah. or that we don't even need that. Let's know. think about it. Like, it's very easy to buy on Coinbase, right? For a new person to come in here and buy, but use your, attach your bank account to Coinbase and buy. And you can get, you know, four or five currencies there, uh, cryptocurrencies. But Coinbase charges a shitload of money in transaction fees. They take a high percentage. So, you know, you can do that and you can trade with a couple coins or you can go to an altcoin exchange and, and um, you can't put USD on there, though. So you have to get from USD to... That, I don't know. That, that's kind of the problem. It's I think if if the initial thing that people thought about taxes was true, that if once you went into crypto, mm -hmm. you only had to pay tax when you move back into dollars, then moving to something like Tether or a stable sure. coin might make sense in between trades. It would make, it would make 100% that. sense. You could do that with Litecoin or something. Like yeah. You don't need this stable coin, but you need something kind of stable to move to overnight if you're a day trader. Yeah. But when we found out last January that absolutely every trade is a tax event then um, there's no point in moving to stable coin you might as well just move to a cash account or you know anything. it's literally an extra step that is unnecessary yeah. in my opinion except for the people with big money who are arbitrate you know doing arbitrage and uh, you know the company obviously Poloniex Cir Circle Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. so they're getting I don't know if we said it but they're getting a point one when you cash out your circle on their app um, when you move it from Poloniex to Circle, then they're taking 0.1% of your uh, U.S. dollars also. So literally, it's not back one-to-one because -one you're automatically losing yeah. a 0.1 percentage. So it's actually a lot. And also, um, you know, Poloniex is making trading fees too. So you're getting, you know, just how you get double tax mm -hmm. on this shit now, you're getting double tax. Yeah, you're getting, triple tax with the stable coin. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Like, triple there's gonna fee is not there's gonna have to be some better. Uh, there's gotta be some better oversight on this. Well, we'll see how much it ends up getting used. Like the volume on Tether was what was so crazy. Like people really, you know, a lot of people used it. The volume was huge. So if this thing is, you know, if it'll work out for Poloniex if it's got anything like Tether's volume. And I feel like the circle coin will probably be adopted onto other exchanges and then there's gonna be a battle between stable coins. There's probably you know there's other stable coins in the works too. So there's always mm -hmm. some stable coins. I prefer though no stable coin at all. Um, I'm not a like an active day trader really anymore, but the, when you were trading a lot and the altcoin market back in the day before you know it was a little more wild west it was kind of cool when 
you know, people weren't using Tether as much. It wasn't a big deal. You know, if Bitcoin was going down, then the alts would pump. You'd move your money into like Litecoin or MadeSafe or Monero or something. And it was a little more, yeah, that's when you saw a lot of like 300%, 20%, 200%, like, you know, weird gains and stuff. But, uh, you know, that doesn't make Sick sense. Gains, to a, that, that doesn't make sense for a normal trader, but uh, I don't know. That was, it was more interesting back then. Mm-hmm. And also the fact that, you know, it's a little off topic, but with dealing with Poloniex, Poloniex and um, BTCE, they had these troll boxes that were like, legendary where the whole crypto trading community was at before you know people were on twitter but really the trade you know crypto trading on twitter was there but the chat rooms and these troll boxes were where you really got like a lot of information about crypto like i can't explain like if you just got into crypto in the last year and you don't weren't privy to these troll boxes you know there's troll boxes on other places too like yobit and liquid and some other ones but those troll boxes were like legendary so much information coming in there so it was a really good time I miss those troll boxes Aww. <laughs> <laughs> now what about this la uh token yeah I, so i went to la token.com to buy a coin that was uh not what is that is that is la token an exchange or? yeah so la tokens an exchange and just like binance has binance coin la token.com has la token coin as well they did an ICO. I can't remember if they raised, I think I want to say 15 million last year, which. A tiny one. Yeah. During that, you know, <laughs> well, during that bubble, it, it was kind of tiny in comparison uh, yeah. what was going on. But so much, that was a while west still kind of, it's a year later. I think they're having more problems. They're, they're up, they're launched, they launch coins. And then before they hit most of the bigger exchanges, there's more volume on stuff like, uh, like I, I know Dragon Chain had a bunch of volume on there recently. Um, you know so what i could say is that it's interesting because what caught my eye was when i logged in right next to login was a button that said tokenize also so that said tokenize login so i was thinking maybe it's just like civic where you tokenize your login and you don't need your email or social security or any of that stuff i thought that might be a cool thing um but it wasn't of course uh, i c- clicked on tokenize and i come from my niche my niche in this whole space is like art music blockchain so it started saying that you can tokenize real assets. It said you can tokenize artworks, all this stuff. So I went through the step by step. There's only a couple steps and filled out some information to tokenize a physical artwork that um, Sasha here actually owns. And um, just to go through the process and see how it worked. I went through the process. It says that you can only tokenize up to 80% of the piece. Um, I'm not sure what the, what the other 20% thing, I, I haven't riddled through that Yeah, yet. that's that was really weird to me thinking, just the idea of tokenizing my physical art seemed bizarre because I can turn around and sell it and your tokens will now be worthless. So what's the point of doing that? But also, why? what would that... Because it's not contractually obligated. Right? Yeah, yeah. But where would that 20% go? Like, is that their tra- their I, I, finder's fee for I'm, it? I'm almost or? 100% it's not their finder's fee. The reason I say that is because when I was looking at their old PR from August 2017, the whole point of LA Token and what they were doing was showing that you can sell this thing without – you can sell your, you know, your assets without any uh, brokerage, really, like 2 to 3% or 30% or whatever anybody else has taken. Like, that was the whole point of it. So I can't imagine that's what it is. I don't know why they say only up to 80% because I know like when I back in the day before I really like thought through this physical physical thing like tokenizing a physical thing like tokenizing this how would you do it like before you know when I was messing around in 2016 I made an artwork I sold the artwork and I tokenized it and I asked you've the, tokenized your t-shirts too your DJ Pepe shirts yeah but the the thing about this is when I tokenized this piece of artwork I asked the buyer I said do you want me to make this divisible so that you can sell shares of the artwork to people, then they can invest in it. And then if you turn around and sell it, then you would get uh, dividends from that. You know, you get your, your investment, like hedging into an investment. But um, he didn't want to do that, um, which is probably fine. The token now to me, you know, it's a cool thing to have, but he can sell the artwork. It's not attached to anything. Like So the, the thing that I'm having issues with uh, in studying the space over the last couple of years, that was particularly art and blockchain, is how we tokenize physical pieces. I recently, you know, earlier this year, I bought 
a piece that was on the blockchain and I haven't, I still can't think it through how it's going to work. I could easily sell that piece to Sasha. Sasha could give it to this lady at the pool right here. It's, it's a, you know, it's a bare it's a, instrument. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't, I don't know how you could track that. Uh, people are trying NFC chips. People are trying things and I'm ecstatic to see somebody make this work. Like that thing would be awesome. Uh, it'd be a whole new economy around art, but I have not seen the evidence that we are there yet. So I don't know how LA Token is going to do this. Sorry for I the tangent. I like just on that on that topic. I like what my friend Nick said about it of car registration. Yeah. Like when you're selling a car, you expect this, you know, registration with it. So it would be the same kind of thing with art. We'd have to move as a whole community to expect these, you know, proof of token with the art mm -hmm. it, we're not there yet even close but that would be the only way that it would work is if everyone demanded that it have this proof of token yeah. but then even that you can probably hack like you can probably make a fake i don't know well that's what like codex is trying to tackle um that was our whole thing is like providence chain of custody and all that stuff because there is an issue in the art world with that there's been numerous times where people have bought fakes for millions of dollars or things have gotten stolen or things terrorists go and ransack a country and start putting the artifacts and you know, esteemed historical items on the art market. Uh, and so there has, there, it would be cool for a solution to that. I don't know if we've, we're there yet, but um, Codex is trying to do it. So pay attention to what they're doing, I guess. Uh, I just don't think we're there yet. I, so be careful with some of this uh, physical tokenization. Like, and it, what happened with LA Exchange? This was the oh, funniest yeah, yeah, part. Yeah. So back to <laughs> what happened, I did it. I did it step by step. And me being curious about, like, what am I actually doing? Like, what is this token? I asked. I said, first, I had a list of questions, and I hit up the help desk, and they were online, and they were like, um, I, you know, I, had, I was going to ask them a list of questions, right? My first question was pretty simple. Sir, what blockchain is this going to be tokenized on? <laughs> it was for not the, simple. For the physical art piece. It was not simple because uh, – <laughs> He didn't have an answer. So, or he or they she. They don't know. They don't know what blockchain they're using yet. They're advertising. You can blockchain tokenize <laughs> your freaking, your physical art. And then, yeah, they don't know what chain they're using. That's so stupid. It's, it's <laughs> the, the dumbest thing, thing I ever, ever heard. So, <laughs> LA Token, uh, Get your let, let us know stuff together. <laughs> and um, buyer and seller beware. Yeah. It, with all of this, it's buyer and seller beware. Yeah, definitely. Um, then we saw some kind of new developments in the law world this week. I don't know if they're that new. It's just, it was the first time that I've seen this happen where, okay, so first we got my big coin and that is a coin where they were purporting, I think some people thought they were Bitcoin instead of <laughs> big coin, but their ticker is MBG. I think they did an ICO and they would be like one of these coins that I would have assumed the SEC would go after for failing to register a security sale. But instead, this one um, was decided that it was under the CFTC's jurisdiction. And uh, so what they did, they raised $6 million from 28 people. They said that they were backed by gold. So I don't know if it's that fact that they said they were backed by gold that moved it from SEC to CFTC, but the the court actually did come out and say this is a commodity, and uh, so that was what was interesting to it to me. They'd met the definition of commodity, and it made me think, well, wouldn't all of these things meet the definition of commodity? And then a couple hours later, we get a new case that kind of explained that, and it said. Maybe maybe other lawyers already knew this, but it was new. I don't think it was that common knowledge. So the SEC is just a subset of the CFTC. So the CFTC governs the whole thing, and then the SEC can govern a, a portion of it. So that's what got clarified from my understanding of it, and that clarity came out of the case against uh, one broker. So they actually, <laughs> lucky them, you know, they're a company based in Austria, selling swaps uh future contracts. yeah so future contracts so that's they got a sued by the by both organizations the sec and the cftc so they get double whammy and their their owner was like well we're an austrian company where does this jurisdiction come from and it was very clear on both complaints it comes out of um interstate commerce <laughs> 
which is the most broad jurisdiction. It's like if you use the mail or the wire or the roads of the United States, then you're, uh, you know, under their jurisdiction. And so that can be simply placing a phone call or sending an email. You're That's into crazy. the wire and the mails. That's wild. Yeah. This is so, such a broad thing. It's very broad. So uh, if you're an Austrian company and you want to follow the global war rules, not the U.S. rules, you can't send a single email or certainly you can't accept a single customer from the U.S. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't know anything about this case except for what you've told me a little bit about, but I'm going to just guess that this is not going to be able to be enforced. Like this is just a thing. Like they're just doing it to show that they can do it, but they could do it. But why would, I don't know. Why would Austrian company fold to this? I don't How How can they fold to this? Would, would Austrian, the government have to like enforce them to be yeah, held accountable? Yeah. So. I think, um, so they sue them in America. The guy's going to have to come to America for, um, <laughs> why would you come to America, bro? Well, yeah, I'm headed to Singapore if I'm that guy. Like. <laughs> well, we saw recently, like Taiwan didn't have an extradition treaty, but they still sent Cody Wilson back to America. So if, if the, if Austria doesn't want to get in a big fight with America, they're going to force the guy to come and you know stand trial here i think i you know i've still got lots to learn on this international business law stuff but from my textbook understanding of how all of that works is if you have if you're out of the country but you have jurisdiction us has jurisdiction over you by you violating you know the commerce clause then your country is going to tell you you have to come here and stand trial so america i'm american america's got a very Shout long arm yeah so america <laughs> is the president of the world. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> well. <laughs> Shout out to America. I'm waving the flag. <laughs> America. America. I do love America, but yeah. it is. Uh, well, it, yeah. it has a pretty big ego <laughs> that it thinks it can go. And it not just thinks, like it can go sue all these but, people. Outside. But you, uh, minimum wage or no money making motherfucker it comes up with two dollars in your pocket you're allowed to go buy a lottery ticket and waste your money but you're not allowed to, to like put it into exchange. you can't put it into this austrian exchange you can't you can do, put it anywhere else you can put it yeah, the, anywhere else that's not crypto. If, if america is not controlling the gambling and making the money off of it then yeah they're gonna come get you because the house has to win yep. um and then do you want to talk about the anon coin yeah, real quick, I, like I've been just looking around at certain things uh, and I saw Anon Coin. Turning the Hodocast into a pump zone for yeah. Anon Coin <laughs> for a few minutes here. <laughs> just kidding. Literally, <laughs> I have like very few Anon Coin. I got them because they're airdropped to me. Oh, listen, this is the point. Every motherfucker out there, if you own Bitcoin, if you own Bitcoin, you have Anon Coin. Unless you own your Bitcoin on Coinbase. Ooh, is that true? Oh, yeah, I guess well, I so. Coinbase should or have any all the exchange. Anon. Well, right, Coinbase right. gets them if right. they choose to give you your forks. This so, is another reason why it's good to hold your own. Th this yeah, this is a co fork, okay, of Z Classic, which was a fork of Zuko's coin, Zcash. I might have been a fork of Z Coin, which is a fork of Z Classic. So many things I don't exa know exactly, but it comes from the. Uh, uh, Zcash. It all comes from Bitcoin. Yeah, it all comes from Bitcoin. So if you own, so it's a co fork, meaning that if you own Z Classic, you got two to one anon. You got two anon to every Z Classic you own. If you own Bitcoin, you got one anon to every Bitcoin you own. So now they're they're traded on a couple markets, and um, I just thought it was interesting because it's it's a co co fork, and um, not a code fork, a co fork. Yeah, co dash fork. And, you know, basically, I think what the market is looking at is who, how many people are going to claim these coins. And after a while, I guess the claiming will end somehow. Maybe. I don't even know. Uh, how do you claim them? I'm not, I'm not even sure. I don't know. Like, um, I know if you had your Anon or if you had Bitcoin. And why are they called Anon? Oh, it's, a pri it's like a privacy. It's a, it's a, here comes some buzzwords. It's a Bitcoin privacy staking masternode coin of some sort 
<laughs> but yeah, if you owned, if you if you haven't been on your Cryptopia account in a while, check it out. If you own Z Classic or Bitcoin, you have some hand on coin there. Um, I just thought it was an interesting thing. I, I, I follow some of this stuff. I think it's just a giant uh, pump and dump, honestly. But uh, what they airdropped it to pump the price up because people will talk about it. Maybe some people that didn't get it might buy it, thinking it's gonna pump, mm -hmm. and then they can sell all theirs. Yeah, like the Telegram group is. Uh, it's like it looks like a pump and dump group. Like on their website, literally, they're talking about all their talk is about getting in in the Telegram group too, and on their website is about getting exchanges to list it. Like they're not. There's not much else to talk about it. Yeah. So when, in my understanding, as a Oh, so you were asking me, he was asking me about that earlier. Like, how can they be talking about getting an exchange, getting an exchange to list it? Because that kind of is something the SEC has come out pretty hard against as a Howey factor. But if they were airdropped, that might be why they're a little bit less at risk of being considered a security because the number one prong investment of money isn't there. But they're, this wasn't an airdrop. Anon wasn't? Oh, because it was a co-fork. Okay. Yeah. You, well, you that's even, make that effort. makes it even further from being a secu an investment of money, right? I so, mean, you had the initial investment of money of Bitcoin, maybe, this, unless you mind it. This is the confusing thing to me. So on one hand, if you own Bitcoin in your cold storage and you want to go get Anon, you have to make a serious effort to probably do that. Like you have to go export your private key, you know, do a couple of things if you've ever worked, done a fork before, you, you know. Um, but if you have, uh, I don't know what other exchanges support, but I know Cryptopia ex supported the fort. So you didn't have to do any work to get the Anon if you had your stuff on that exchange. So I think that that would present some kind of drama in that argument well about like how much work you yeah how, like how in much the, the Tomahawk was. case they came in and they came out and said that one was airdropped and someone got a score at that Anna, they got Anna bags Ooh, they there. love it <laughs> yeah um no in Tomahawk they said that you can be still considered a security even if there's no investment of money if you're investing time like a bounty program or something like that is still you're getting paid for your work. So that's the same as an investment of money. So if they came out on this and said, it seems to me like such a crazy overreach. Like originally it's supposed to be an investment of dollars. Now we've gone, it can be an investment of crypto. Proof it of can work. Be an invest yeah. <laughs> it just, it keep, you know, they keep taking another inch, you, you know, but no one's stopping them from, no one really seems to be able to stop them from keeping pushing the, how far this how we test really goes of what is or isn't a security so now i don't know <laughs> yeah it's i don't know what is or isn't i just uh almost assume everything is and uh, kind of the safest yeah. way to do it yeah. <laughs> just stay on the right side of the sec or don't sell <laughs> to any americans <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah and to be clear so this is the anon right i don't know it's, it, maybe it's called anon coin but it, it's called anon as i know it there's also Anon Coin on Coin Market Cap. So oh, <laughs> Anon Coin actually pumped like 100% the day of that fork. People by might, accident. <laughs> well, or people that were holding it were pumping it to show, so that people thought that that was the you know people were buying into that Anon. It was coin. confusing. Confused. Same thing with like when BCC, Bitcoin Connect had the same ticker as Bitcoin Cash, and I think that could have been part of the early pump on that too. So. So where do you think this whole market is going to go? Um, it's going to go up. Like it has to go up. It's only a few hundred billion dollars right now, a couple hundred billion dollars right now. It's down 75% from where it was six months ago. And um, the cryptocurrency is not going anywhere. There's going to be a lot of oversight regulation, things happening in this space. But it's being, even in this bear market, a lot of the bro investors have left. And I see a lot of building, a lot of community stuff going on. A lot of like roadmaps call for like a year. Community. <laughs> a lot of, yeah. we, got, we got a peanut gallery over here. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, you know, a lot of roadmaps show one, two to three years out for things being built. So like, you know, you're going to, you're going to see this happening. Um, Do you think um, McAfee will eat his penis? <laughs> I hope not. Me it's too. Disgusting. No, but it also means that the price is uh, oh. oh, gross. 
<laughs> Would you rather eat your penis rare or oh well God. done, Mr. Went, McCaffrey? Went on a crazy tangent there. Yeah. Um, well, let's maybe tell people a little context of that. So I think McAfee, um, you know, John McAfee, the creator of the antivirus software, has become a pioneer in the crypto space where he has said he really like was a big altcoin promoter on Twitter. And it came out that everyone that asked him to promote their coin was paying him something like $100,000 to make the tweet. And everyone was listening to him. So as soon as he would make a tweet, the token would really skyrocket. It was a game, actually. When he first started that, mm -hmm. like, everybody knew, like, you had, everybody put alerts on his Twitter. Like, the minute that he tweeted, then people would go. Buy the coin. Buy the coin. Yeah. Pump fly. And then every coin that he did, every day, he did a new one. And then it kind of, like, uh, watered it down. So, like, the first pump mm -hmm. was, like, pretty good. And then, like, Electronium, I think, was like, all right. And then. It got like everybody started catching on. Like, all right, everybody's hip to what's going on here. Yeah, like, <laughs> but geez. he goes around to all the conferences. He brings a huge entourage. Like, he's got this uh, kind of younger wife that um, is very, you know, you just see them like, and they've got maybe ten entourage of like ex-military people around them. So he's never traveling alone, and uh, he'll get on and he'll talk a lot about the importance of anonymity in Bitcoin. He'll talk about the importance of uh, um, censorship resistance and the importance of trying to get banking relationships with crypto because that's a big challenge right now and the rooms just fill right up and he is a great speaker I, i've met him a couple times now i really liked him a lot, of, a lot of people don't like everyone has a he's a polarizing kind of person people either love or hate him um i'm on the mcafee lover side myself just uh, just because i think the whole thing's so funny like <laughs> this old man that you know he was a he was Isn't charged he with murder in uh belize for a while and i he first came on my radar from the joe rogan podcast he was broadcasting from belize and he was running every day from the cops and someone had killed his dog and the person that he suspected killed his dog turned up dead and the Mexican police assumed or, you know, were charging McAfee. He was never proved guilty for it. But um, anyway, at that point, he couldn't come back to the U.S. That all got sorted out. Now he said he was on the run from the SEC for a while. I think that's been sorted out since then, too. There's been multiple kidnap attempts against him. I'm not sure who is trying to kidnap him, but they're very real at one conference someone came up um, and sat next to me and talked all about this Facebook, like social media thing they were building, but they didn't know shit about Bitcoin or blockchain. And I remember sitting there thinking, who the heck is this person? Why do they have any right to be making a coin? They don't know anything. Then I end up talking to McAfee later and he thought that that person was there to kidnap him. <laughs> Yeah. I, then we looked really carefully at that guy's card that he gave me. It said he worked for a big company. And then when we looked carefully at the logo and the placing of the name, it was not right. Like it was a made up card that I had in my hand. So it was really, I, I don't know, it was a bizarre thing, but... But back to McAfee, so he is very bullish on the overall long-term price of Bitcoin, and he said that if by 2020 the price isn't a million dollars, he's going to eat his own penis. Is it 2020 or 2021? I don't know. I thought it was with the halving, the next halving. Yeah, we could be wrong on some of this, <laughs> but it's something like he's going to eat his dick if the price isn't a million dollars at some point in the future. So. We're rooting for him to keep his penis. I think his wife probably is too. Um, McAfee's known to be a real ladies' man. He's kind of like a Hugh Hefner figure. Um, so <laughs> the world will be at a huge loss if three years from now he has to, you know, do that. He's he's not doing that either way. <laughs> He'll go on the run again, I think. Protect, but do you think there's protect, a chance protect that, McAfee's penis at all costs yes pump that price of, <laughs> to a million dollars we have to have it now I wonder if it's if it touches a million then he's safe or does it have to stay over a million because we you I'm know we've sure seen some volatility anything close to a million yeah. it's just worth like yeah I don't know <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of bizarre. And also, it, he didn't like announce it. It was like a tweet that he said if Bitcoin's going to hit a certain price, and then some other trader, crypto trader dude, I think his name is Magara or whatever, he hit him, he hit, answer, replied to him and said, um, I forget, like, if it doesn't, then what? He's like, if it doesn't, then I'll eat my own dick. Like, so it was like a reply. It's like comment. a joke, too. Yeah. yeah, he could probably get out of that uh, by saying he was, it was said in jest and not a real contractual obligation. Yeah. So. Uh -huh, uh -huh. 
I'll be on the side of uh, getting out of that for him if he ever needs. <laughs> um, what else? You did some new artwork and listed it. Do you want to tell people? Oh, yeah. So, um, Mud Bags. Yeah. I got a new piece called Mud Bags. <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's an ode to the hold, the hodl. It's a very uh, scary thing for some people during this time to hold. So it's a piece where uh, it's a simple piece of a lady crying. <laughs> Check it out. It's at superrare.co. Um, I think they're about to turn the music on us here soon, so we better be careful how long we go. Um, but yeah, I have all my artwork uh, at rarescrilla.com, so check out all that music and art stuff. I'm getting a new piece, two new pieces for my wall. One is a honey badger that he did for me, and the other one is a giant framed photo of DJ Pepe. Oh, yeah, that's gonna be beautiful. A yeah, that was done by a Venezuelan artist. Pepe Hawking. Pepe Hawking. Shout out to Pepe Hawking. So he, he took DJ Pepe, which if you don't know DJ Pepe, check at DJ Pepe underscore on Twitter. He's the uh, first meme to escape the meme pool. I manage him. He's a real alpha. Yeah, he's very alpha. He speaks to humans at conferences. He's a cardboard cutout, but he's able to talk. So he's probably a more interesting figure in Bitcoin, under the radar still to most people. But... um. Yeah, Pepe Hawking. A lot of people have done artwork of DJ Pepe that know him and like fan artwork. He's and been an advisor on a couple of blockchain projects too. Yeah, Panisium was one of them. Romeo Token. Romeo Token. The failed Romeo Token. Jesus. Oh, Pepe, DJ Pepe should have been a little more diligent on that one. <laughs> his advising skills. <laughs> He's a terrible advisor unless he's talking about art and music. <laughs> and he likes the ladies. Yeah, he loves the ladies. <laughs> but, um, what else we got? Oh, I was going to talk about my conferences coming up. So I'm good. I get to go to a couple of fun things. Next week is Crypto Springs in California and Palm Springs. And that's a like ladies only conference, I think. I think it started out like that. Yeah. There might be a few guys there now, but. Uh, I think like I saw like, uh, uh, um, whatever his name is, Jackson from Dogecoin tweet out that he was also speaking there. And he was like, I'm, uh, there's only like six of the 40 speakers are men or something. And like, but he was like excited about it. And everybody jumped on it. Well, not everybody, but a lot of like uh, men. A lot of the alphas. Pro, pro men people jumped on like, <laughs> I don't even, meninists. There you go. Meninists jumped on them. It was like, oh, how are you going to, I don't know. It's fucking bizarre. Crypto is bizarre. And in my opinion, there's a ton of women in crypto. And yeah. it, it's not about if there's women and men and yeah, diversity is great. I love diversity. But mm -hmm. if you're not the best, you, you, that's the only, you talk to the best. If it's black, white, woman, no genitalia, anything, it doesn't matter. Memes. Memes. And that's the thing, too. Like, DJ Pepe spoke at a uh, conference before, but he doesn't get a lot of action either. Like, I don't see people hitting up DJ Pepe to speak at all these conferences. And that's a, Maybe they I don't could, know he's still. I could say that that's bigotry too. You know, the memes yeah, should memes be able to speak to too. Able he's very have smart. A voice too. You know, so he's actually the first uh, meme to make a uh, exclusive playlist. So, mm -hmm. yeah, using blockchain, very interesting. Yeah, I'm excited to meet Elizabeth Stark of Light and learn more about Lightning Labs next week. That's my main thing. And going with Rosa from uh, Block Spaces mm -hmm. and Leah um, Wald. We're sharing a hotel, so that'll be fun get to know them more. Um, they called it the Coachella type conference. Like it's gonna be laid back by a pool, not, no ICO pitches or anything. So it'll be good. And then um, I got invited on the Contra cruise, which is like a libertarian cruise that Tatiana Moroz was speaking on and she had like, she could bring a plus one. So I'm supposed to be going to that with her. We're going to go leave from L.A. and uh, go through Mexico seven days straight on a boat. I've never been on a cruise before, so <laughs> kind of uh, it'll be fun. And then it's the World CryptoCon after that. I'm going with uh, Lynn, and Lynn Albright is bringing me as her plus one to that, so that will be fun too. And uh, then I'm going on the world crypto or the, what tour is it? The tour to crypto. I'm going to bike from LA to, or sorry, from Vegas, from that world crypto con to somewhere. I don't know how far I'm going to make. My goal is to do two days. They're doing a hundred miles a day. So I think 200 miles, is probably my upward limit of the biking. I don't know how they're doing it to bike all across America. There is it's no crazy. way that they're doing a hundred miles a day for 
30, 60 days straight away. That's just they're so going to have such bad they chafing. Be, they would be dead. Like, sorry, because they're not professional bikers. Well, I think they've been training for a while for it, but. No, I think it's a dope cause. Like, yeah. But I just think, I, I, I don't know if they're biking the whole way or not. I'm going to have the guy, Blake Rizzo, who's like their marketing coordinator. He's also a corporate um, attorney. He's going to come give me an update on them in a couple weeks. We'll see how they're doing. And I guess, uh, lastly, um, I'm teaching with Cynthia Gaten the final course of our three-part intro to crypto, crypto art, crypto music, and creatives, blockchain for creatives for the Washington area, lawyers for the arts. Um, it's in Washington, D.C. Part three is on Monday. Uh, that's what, tomorrow? No, it's in two days. So if you're in mm-hmm. D.C., you can sign up for that class. Uh, we look forward to bringing that class elsewhere as well. Um, me Hopefully and her, to Tampa. Yeah, to Tampa would be nice. We've done some stuff in Atlanta, New York, and uh, Baltimore. Um, also, I'm going to be in Atlanta on October 5th for the A3C Festival. I'm going to be talking to um, people about blockchain and music. I'm a panelist along with uh, somebody from FanCoin and somebody from uh, eMusic, which is a uh, legacy uh, distribution for indie artists like um, CD Baby or Orchid or something like that. Um, the cool thing about A3C is, I mean, it's like Little Wayne, Diplo or Dipset, Wu Tang. Uh, oh, I want to be there. It's like a ton of people. I mean, all, all it's a huge hip hop conference. Jim Jones uh, festival. Uh, if, if, if Dipset's there, yeah. <laughs> Jimmy. And uh. So this will be like, I mean, I've gone a bunch of years. I've performed there and I've also thrown parties there. So this will be my first one doing like a tech speaking thing. So I'm looking forward to that. I've been trying to rail people onto music and blockchain in interesting ways for uh, going on almost five years now. So this will be, uh, this will be like the, this will be the best thing I think so far in terms of that to reach a audience of real musicians who care about this stuff. So. And why does blockchain make sense for music? It makes sense in terms of licensing, instant pay. Like, uh, so if you have a publishing deal, you're not going to usually, number one, the accounting of that publishing deal, you have to trust that they're, they're paying you on what's being played on, you know, BET or a movie or a commercial or getting played on. There's different entities too. Like as there's ASCAP, there's BMI, then there's like, um, CSAC, there's a uh, sound exchange which monitors a whole different area of publishing. So all these places, like you expect, you, you know, expect them to send you a check. You can't monitor what's really going on. Or most musicians definitely don't have the capabilities to do it. They don't make enough money to even pay a lawyer to look at it because you know if you're trying to collect two hundred fifty dollars royalties and you got to pay a lawyer four hundred dollars an hour, then what's the point? Um, so with with music. In blockchain, the awesome thing about it is that if you can get paid instantly for every time your music is played anywhere, you can have smart contracts to say automatically, like if you want to use this piece in a YouTube video, you have automatic splits. Um, tune, like I like Wait, tune- though, so would they have to know ahead of time that they're going to use your music in a YouTube video and put it, like would all that have to be done ahead of time or how? You just make a blanket uh, contract probably and say, all right, this x equals x or x equals y like it's like okay. if this happens if you want to use 10 seconds of this song you could be as particular as you want i think but if you want to use 10 seconds of this song it's this much if you want to use the whole song it's this much if you want to use it to perform you know it's a whole different uh copyright and publishing stuff that can go on so um yeah, that's the cool thing also just the instant so like when you make a song you may if you don't know about music you may say oh shit the artist is great the artist is fantastic generally the artist is good, yes, but there's so many other elements that make the artist pop, like producer, manager, uh, art, marketing guy. Like, there's so many. This is a team game, like in anything. It's like business. Like, it's not just an artist. Like, the artist is the face. Sometimes the artist isn't even the songwriter, you know. Um, so, like again, songwriting get paid. So, like, what what is a cool thing? And I've talked about it before. Is Tune music. I have no stake in tune in terms of uh, they should ownership. Be giving you stake. They you should. Talk I talk about them, them so goddamn so much. much. But they're like a house music entity, and that's kind of where they, they come love from. Unicorns. Yeah. So um, they have a cool concept. They're, they're they're the furthest along in the space. There's a lot more development that needs to happen, but uh, they instant like if I made me and K made to make a song, he has an account on tune. 
instantly I can say 50% goes to the artist, 50% goes to me. Um, even if I, you know, Sasha could get a, uh, an account. If she was my lawyer, I could be like 10% goes to her for something. Like it's, I have it a playlist cool. on right. it. Yeah. You have a play. Like if you're not even a music, but this is another cool thing. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm pumping tune here, but it, it like, it, if you're, <laughs> if you're a user, you're just, just a consumer and you make playlists or something like SoundCloud, you make a cool playlist. People are listening to it. You don't get any monetization off that with tune you can monetize these playlists so every so like if i want to um i have my songs on tune and then i assign them a percentage like i'll give five percent of this notes notes is the currency for uh tune i'll give five percent of my notes to uh anybody that puts it in their playlist i'll give 90 percent of my notes to anybody that puts it in a playlist you get it so uh you it's like it? yeah do you see it you see it you see it <laughs> <laughs> So it's really cool. Check out Shun.co. Like the, the music and blockchain is going to be a thing. On top of everything else, there's a branding aspect of it that um, I, I did with Can't Smoke a Bitcoin. And you can go to my Twitter. I did a thread on that, um, how many different blockchain projects I used to promote my one song featuring Peter Schiff and Krista Rose called Can't Smoke a Bitcoin. And we have a new song coming out soon called I Wear Gucci featuring another very prominent member of the crypto space that you may be surprised and he's going to be very surprised at. So that's an, ex that's an exclusive news right there, Sasha. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You heard it here <laughs> first people. So yeah, I wear Gucci. I don't yet. Someday. I have a fake Gucci belt that somebody bought me. Oh yeah. I bought him it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone. Have a good Saturday. And meeting.